guys, uh, let us discuss in this section about the AIMS questions of the November 2019 session. These are the recalls that we have got from the obviously the memory base recalls from the students those who appeared for the AIMS exam, right. So questions were simple again, but the pattern in this in which they were asked actually they make it complicated or you can say simply lengthy, right. So student get less time to think about it and then mark the queries. Let us see how the questions were asked. Number one is which one of the uh, of these is the correct option in relation to fracture IT of the femur, right, intertrochanteric femur. From the very beginning in the final year, we start reading the differences in the IT fracture and the neck of femur. Let us see which one is correct over here. More common in male than females. See guys, both the fractures, either it is a IT fracture or it is a neck of femur fracture, we have been reading that both the fractures, proximal femoral fractures are more common in the females. Reason is simple because of postmenopausal status. Right. So, osteoporotic fractures are more common in the proximal femoral area. So, more common not in males, it is more common in females. So, we are not taking this one as the right option. Second one says, one year mortality rate is around 20 to 30 percent. It is right that irrespective of the advancements in the treatment plan for IT fractures like proximal femoral nail or dynamic hip screw, the mortality rate still remembers approximately 25 to 30 percent. Right. So, ranging in between 20 to 30 percent, that is the correct option. Right. Chances of non-union are more as compared to fracture neck of femur. Now, all of you know that the non-union or AVN are more commonly related to the neck of femur instead of IT fractures. IT fracture has got more common complication of a malunion, right. So, this one is also wrong. One year mortality rate can be reduced by operating within 48 hours. Although if you ask me practically, this one seems to be somewhat correct that if you operate it early, chances of prognosis will be better. But we do not have any standard text literature which tells us that if you operate within first 48 hours, the prognosis at one year will be all right, right. So, this one does not seem fine. So, which one is the correct answer here? That is option B. The intertrochanteric fracture presenting most commonly with the malunion treated usually by proximal femoral nail or dynamic hip screw. Mortality rate in those cases are around 20 to 30 percent, right. That is question number one. Second one is it was a multiple correct, uh, multiple option. You have to choose them, the answer correct type. It was about the CTV, right. So, they asked the four, they gave you the four options and they want you to answer which one is actually correct. CTV is more common in male and is usually bilateral. You know that majority of the cases of CTV, they are idiopathic, right. And majority of these children do not have any other anomaly associated with them. So, majority of them, they are usually bilateral and yes, they are more common in male child. Some literature do mention that female have got more incidence of or equal incidence of males, but majority literature says that it is male more than female. Equinus should be corrected first is what they asked, right. So, what is the usual steps of correction? That is CAVE. First, we always correct the cavus, then we go for adductus, then we go for virus and then we go for equinus. So, do remember equinus is always the last to be treated and for correction of equinus, we need the tenotomy of tendo Achilles. Right. So, cave is the usual sequence that we use to treat the idiopathic cases of CTV. With Ponsetti technique, the correction rate is 90 percent. You know that right now worldwide there is only one way to correct CTV and that is what we are following the cave sequence. It was given by Ponsetti. That is what you call Ponsetti technique. In majority of the cases when you follow the cave sequence, it is very much possible that you are going to get the correction in the feet. But it sometime in the neglected kind of cases or relapsed kind of cases, syndromic kind of cases, that is what you call atypical CTVs, these will not be corrected even by the Ponsetti technique, right. So, 90 percent children's, yes, majority of them, they can be treated by simple Ponsetti technique. Then foot is adducted and supinated, yes, that is right. In the cases of CTV, you know that the deformities are cavus, adductus, varus, inversion and what you lead to last is the equinus. When all these are combining basically, the foot which into inversion and like this, inversion simply means that under surface of the foot is facing medially, right. So, when these all combine, we get the deformities of adduction as well as the supination, right. So, what are the correct options here? The option number A, it seems to be correct, right. So, equinus we said it should be corrected first, no, equinus is the last to be treated. So, option B remains wrong. Then we have got three correct options here, option A, C and D, right. So, equinus should be corrected first is absolutely wrong. What we need to correct first? the cavus, okay. So, three options are right, the A, C and D. Then we have got number three, match the following along with the images which are shown to you. There were four options given, one is osteogenesis imperfecta, Klippelfeld syndrome, neurofibromatosis and the Marfan syndrome. So, it is neurofibromatosis and Marfan syndrome, okay. Now, you see in the first image, what do you see? 
the bowing, severe bowing of the bones bilaterally that is on the femur as well as in the tibia and fibula. All the bones are severely deformed. Suggestive of the soft bones, maybe in the multiple stages of fracture healing, they are deformed now. So that is a classical picture that you see in which conditions? The osteogenesis imperfecta. Second picture you see, there is a scoliotic deformity on the back of the child and somewhat the neck also seems to be in a kind of torticollis, right? This is a picture that is classically seen in the children's of Klippelfeld syndrome. This hyperflexibility of the fingers, which is trying to show you what? The Marfan syndrome, right? And then you have got neurofibromatosis depicted in the picture by these patches on the back, okay? So what is our correct option here? The osteogenesis imperfecta 1 is A. Then you have got second Klippelfeld syndrome is B. Third, neurofibromatosis is D. And fourth one, the Marfan syndrome is actually the image C. So our option number A, it stands correct over here. Right, these were the picture based MCQs, you have to match the following side A with side B. Then you have number 4, arrange the options in sequence as a part of surgical intervention for CDH. It was asked for congenital dislocation of the hip, when you are trying to treat a child of developmental dysplasia or congenital dislocation of the hip, how you proceed for the surgical intervention. Right, you know that surgical intervention is required when you have not given the child initially any kind of treatment. Okay, so in the, what are the steps of surgery, that is what they want to ask you. Okay. So what we do, first of all you will have to obviously give the incision on the skin, you have to spread the muscle, you have to reach the hip joint and then find the capsule of the hip joint, right. Once you find the capsule of the hip joint, you cut the capsule, locate the acetabulum where it is located, right. Then after that what you do, relocate the femoral head, you just pull it down and just put it back into the acetabular area. Now here you can feel whether the pressure is more or equal or less. If you feel that you require some kind of a steot mean, now that has to be done. Right? So, exact sequence of surgical intervention for any kind of CDH intervention is A, B, C, D. Right? That is our option A. First, capsule, cut it, find the acetabulum head of femur, pull the head of femur back into the acetabulum and then when you feel the pressure is more around the head of femur, you can do the osteotomies. That is your question number 4 in relation to CDH. Number 5, you have to match the side A with side B. There were 4 deformities or 4 kind of problems given and 4 kind of conditions given that we have to match. Maidlung's deformity. What exactly is Maidlung's deformity? In Maidlung's deformity, there is growth arrest on the distal part of radius on the medial side. That is usual in the palmar aspect, right? What I mean to say is the distal radius from here, that is my ulnar side, that's my uh, this radial side. So distal part of radius from the medial side, it fails to develop. So when it doesn't develop, there is an ulna which is articulating with lower part of the radius. So they fail to make any kind of joint here. So ulna is free and ulna usually subluxates dorsally, okay? So distal part of radius from the medial side it fails to grow, there is no articulation for the ulna and ulna subluxates dorsally, that's what you call made lungs. So made lung will be seen around the ridge joint. So one will be B. What is Haglund's deformity? See norm, normally if you see the posterior surface of calcaneum, it is somewhat like this and there is an attachment of one ligament over here, that's what you call tendo achilles, right? Some people who are overusing the tendo achilles like the tailors, athletes, there will be a continuous pull of the tendo achilles on the back of calcaneum. After some time, this smooth projection of the calcaneum, it shows you a projection of calcaneum like this. This abnormal prominence on the back of calcaneum is what you call Haglund's deformity. It was a direct question just before two years back in the AIMS examination, right? So Haglund's will be seen on the calcaneal area. Buttonhole deformity, the botanial deformity or the buttonhole deformity, you all know swan neck and buttonhole, these are two deformities seen characteristically in rheumatoid arthritis. And then gun stock. What's that gun stock? It's cubitus varus. Seen in which kind of fractures? Associated with fracture, supracondylar humerus. Right? So which one is correct over here? So one goes to B, second goes to the D, third is C and fourth one is A. That's our correct sequence of match the following. Next is a athlete is complaining of pain at the medial and anterior aspect of the leg which increases on running and even walking now. Due to the pain now he is unable to run, x-ray shows no abnormality grossly, what is the most likely diagnosis? Now hints, what are the hints here? He is an athlete, he is complaining of pain at where? Leg, right? He is complaining of pain at the leg, one point. Second, increases on running and even walking. That means initially he was not suffering from any kind of pain, any kind of problem, but now he has started getting the pain, okay? Now he is unable to run because of pain, x-ray shows nothing. What is that telling you? It is simply focusing on one simple kind of fracture, that's what you call a stress fracture. Stress fractures are usually not seen on x-rays for initially some time. And what is the best modality to diagnose it that time? It is MRI. So if you want to diagnose in this patient what he is suffering from, you should go for MRI. 
these kind of injuries or these kind of micro trauma, micro fractures in the tibia, you can simply call them stress fractures or what you call them is a shin splints, right? Shin splints are also known as the medial stress syndrome. What exactly happens in them? The some people who are not accustomed to do certain kind of activities when they start them suddenly, then what happens? They start getting overuse or a normal bone. Stress fracture is same thing. When you are giving excessive stress to a normal bone, you kind of getting stress fractures. So this is what you call a medial tibial stress syndrome in which the medial part and the entire part of tibia, they start getting pulled and they start giving you pain while you are doing the physical exertion. So patient has started just running, he is an athlete now, he cannot run now, x-ray shows you nothing, it's nothing else. It's a kind of stress fracture or simply a shin sprint. What's the Jones fracture? Jones fracture is the fracture of base of fifth metatarsal, right? Nutcracker fracture again occurs in the foot when you are trying to just uh, pushing any kind of nut by your foot. So, cuboidal injury is basically. Lisfranc fracture is the fracture through the tarso metatarsal joint. So, these are different fractures that were the options given in that particular exam. Number seven, what is the most common cause of scoliosis as per the image given, right? There was an image given as per the recall by the student. There was an x-ray given in which part of the vertebra was not developed. That means some this kind of image. So, in this image you can see that on one side the vertebra is fully developed. But here the central part of vertebra is not developed. So, this patient is definitely going to develop some sort of scoliosis, right? So, when there is failure of development of a vertebra leading to a kind of problem is, you know the reason it is congenital. Now, broadly scoliosis can be because of two reasons. One is congenital and one is idiopathic, right? Congenital basically can be because of a wedge vertebra. When the vertebra is like this that you see on the screen, either it is wedge vertebra or it is a hemi vertebra, only half part is formed. So, obviously other part of the vertebra is going to get deviated and it is going to show you some sort of scoliosis, right? So, when they show you some abnormality, anatomical abnormality, it is obviously a kind of congenital scoliosis, right? <coughs> scoliosis can be congenital or idiopathic. Idiopathic is said to occur in three ways. One, it can be infantile or it can be juvenile or it can be simply adult set. Right? We call it infantile in less than 3 years of kids, when more than 3 years juvenile and more than 10 years of patient then adolescent onset of scoliosis. Right? That was about scoliosis. So, do remember anatomical abnormality will be definitely a kind of anatomical problem, the congenital scoliosis. 8. Identify the given splint. Now, you see what is being given. There is a brace or splint give, uh, worn by this patient which is keeping the wrist in extension, fingers in extension. That means you do not want the finger or the wrist to drop down. Right? In which case we see this kind of picture where the wrist and fingers are dropped down. That is what you call a wrist drop or a finger drop. Seen in cases of radial nerve palsy. What is the implant or uh, the splint used for the radial nerve injuries? That is simply your, the cock up splint. So, this is nothing else other than cock up splint. Dynamic finger splint should have covered only the fingers. Why that should be covering the wrist or the part of the forearm, right? So, this is called a cock up splint. That is a kind of dynamic basically splint which is given to avoid any kind of contracture in the wrist or the finger areas. Number 9, a patient presented with open fracture and some loss of bone at the site of trauma. He was managed as shown in the image, identify the appliance. Now you see when somebody has come to you with an open fracture, first plan, first management of that kind of case is obviously a debridement. You have to give an antibiotic and obviously you need to fix or stabilize the fracture anyhow. So intramedullary implants or putting a big implant inside the bone is not preferable in the open fracture because of the risk of infection. So what we want to put is a kind of external fixations, right? What are the different kind of external fixation device we know? I will tell you about the simple ones that everybody knows. One is Elizaro, right? We all of us, we know about it. Second one is what you call a Jess. Jess is an Indian implant which stands for Joshi External Stabilization System. Now, in continuation of to these advancements, we have got some more which are known as the rail fixators. The picture given to you in your exam is this one that is what you call a rail fixator which is also called as LRS that is limb reconstruction system the LRS right. You see this there are slots right through these we have to pass the pins. Once you pass the pins and then you can keep on distracting them so that we can increase the length of the bone. So, Elizero, Jess and rail fixator these are kind of three kind of fixators which we have. We have one more that is something known as AO fixators you can skip that that is a fixator given by one of the orthopedic society. So, AO fixators, Elizero fixators, Jess fixator or rail fixator. These are four kind of external fixators which can be used in orthopedics. 
Then we have got number 10, a patient presented with history of fall on outstretched hand, identify the fracture. It was very simple, it was a repeat. In fact, two years back this was a question in your AIMS exam and now again in 2019 November. What is this? The distal radius you see, the fracture in the shaft of the distal radius, right? And then what you see the distal radial joint is subluxated. So what it is? Nothing else other than your galaxy, right? So that was a picture of galaxy. How will you differentiate it from Montegia? Do remember, M is Montegia and M should be the medial bone. Which is the medial bone? The ulna. So when there is a fracture of the proximal ulna, shaft of ulna, with dislocation of the proximal radial joint, that's what you call a Montegia fracture, okay? So this one was galaxy. It was a repeat. It was asked two years back also and here also. Then you have got last from this instrument. See, instrument part is again important and I have been sharing the PDF of instrument with all my students who have been in my class. So, please go through the file of PDF of that instrument and implant in orthopedics. In All India also, we had got one implant based, uh, this instrument based question. That was your Morris retractor, that was in 2018. Then we got the, uh, I suppose, bone nibbler was asked in 2019. Now in the AIMS exam, you have got this another implant of orthopedics, which is what you call the plate holding forcep, right? Bone holding forcep will have the same picture, same, you know, design like this. That's what you call a bone holding forcep would be somewhat like this. But you see the anterior most part of this. This is what you call a plate holding forcep. So if you have that file, you can very well differentiate what is the difference in the bone holding and plate holding forcep. Go through that, right? So this was a plate holding forcep, it was asked to you. Questions were simple, but yet language was made lengthy. You need to match them, you need to think about them. So time was actually less as compared to the length of the paper. Obviously, it was AIMS and it was supposed to be like that, right? So if you are going exclusive for AIMS, prepare in that terms only. There were video based questions, there were multiple matching type and right now you know that AIMS change the pattern and there are seven different types of questions which are going uh, they are going to ask you in the AIMS exam, right? So be ready for them, be prepared for them and right now focus on the NEET 209, right? So all the best guys, this is all from the orthopedic area. Thank you very much.